next to me is my dear friend, and you are the chair of the Professional Sports Alliance. Am I right? That is correct. Okay. And um, so... I got one answer right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right? Um, so this is Mayor Dyer. For those of you that don't know him, you're one of my favorite mayors um, for many, many reasons. But um, so I want you to say, I want you to tell everyone a little bit about eSports and why you're into it and kind of give us, you know, background on what you're doing. So by the way, I walked in and Hillary said, um, you're introducing the eSports panel. I said, okay, that's <laughs> fantastic. So we all enjoy watching professional sports or watching a live game. We enjoy watching it on television. And the next iteration is eSports. And everybody in here, every mayor knows a little bit about it, but you don't even know what you don't know about it, save uh, maybe the mayor of Arlington knows as much about it as anybody. But um, eSports is an industry that is just, um, just the last several years just blossomed. And it's unbelievable the amount of people that are participating, that are playing against each other. Uh, there are sc at schools that now give scholarships to uh, people that are learning, going to be on their teams. The NBA and probably some other leagues have eSports teams that they field to play against each other. I still didn't quite get the fascination of watching somebody else play a video game, um, but at the last <laughs> panel, one of these guys explained, it's like you grew up playing football or baseball, so you enjoy watching somebody play football or baseball. Your kids grew up playing video games, and they enjoy watching people who are better than they are. In fact, some of the best in the world participate in those games, and they have created an unbelievable industry. And if cities can figure out what their role in it is and how to harness some of the economic impact of this, you're going to be very impressed. And I'm going to guess that everyone here learned something they didn't know about this industry from this panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. One of the reasons I got involved kind of of eSports um, and Jason and I were talking about it last time um, that I think it was in Boston. Yeah. Um, but, and I'm sure many of you mayors have, have this issue or some of you know what I'm talking about. If you have facilities that are probably very outdated in your city and you're kind of trying to figure out how to revitalize them, reinvent yourself, things like that. And um, Reno certainly has a few of them. So it really started to get me thinking. And then I started to do a lot of research. It really, really is impressive. And this is the wave of the future. And um, if you're a mayor, you know you know how important it is to be relevant and to know. There's so many different facets, too, to eSports, which is going to be fascinating. So I really want to turn it over to the experts. I'm going to let you handle it, Nate. I want you to <laughs> you roll some vines with me. But the experts. I, would love, I would love for you to introduce each one of, the, um, one of your friends that are here. And um, you guys are like the. I mean, you guys are like the cool kids. I, the mayors probably don't know that, but you really, you really are. So it's really, it's exciting to have you guys here. So take it away, Nate. We've come full circle for being stuffed in our lockers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Bre Brendan had a height advantage. I didn't. Um, right. uh, hi, everybody. I'm Nathan Lindbergh. I'm the senior uh, director on global sponsorships at Twitch. Um, Twitch.tv is an Amazon subsidiary. Uh, we're a live streaming service. Um, dedicated to kind of broadcasting and um, all the excitement around video games. Um, so that's me. I'll let Brandon and Jason introduce themselves as well. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Brandon Snow. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief uh, Revenue Officer for Activision Blizzard's eSport division. Uh, we're about uh, two years old. I had the last 11 years of my career at the NBA, National Basketball Association, where I was uh, overseeing and monetizing the NBA's relationship with, uh, with brands all around the world and made the transition to eSports about a year ago. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later about what I do. But uh, I'm based in New York, but uh, we're headquartered in uh, California and we are a video game manufacturer. We make video games. Great. Uh, my name is Jason Wu. I'm the general manager and chief strategy officer for Next Generation eSports. We are a white label uh, production company that supports folks like Brandon and Activision Blizzard, as well as Nathan and Twitch, IP holders to create in-studio digital assets that we're going to see in a second, as well as live events. Um, I got into the space about two and a half years ago, started a company with a bunch of friends. Uh, before that, I was in banking, did about 12 years in M&A. So, Pretty close to what I'm doing now. You'd be shocked at the amount of bankers that are now in esports yeah. too. By the way, banking's not that fun. Lots. Um, uh, do, can we get the screen changed? Is that? Sorry. We're gonna have an awkward silence here. 
Just a quick show of hands. Who here is familiar with Twitch? Okay, that's more than I expected. More than five. Who, who here has watched something on Twitch? Okay. Who here has a larger phone bill because of Twitch? <laughs> yeah, okay. That one, uh, that one usually gets a lot more hand raises. Okay, so I'm going to talk quickly about Twitch and then kind of get into eSports um, and then talk with our panelists and our experts about kind of how uh, mayors can get involved and how we can kind of connect on the, on the platform. I think there's two things to take away from the meeting today. I think one, obviously, is the economic impact that eSports can have uh, and the ability to harness it as a way to connect uh, with your constituents. As well, Twitch can be a platform where you can utilize to connect with a, a younger constituent. And some of your colleagues uh, in Congress have been in the news recently about that. Um, but first and foremost, we're going to talk about attention. Um, based on this chart, I think most of you have stopped listening to me by now. Um, but it's a tough space that we're in, right? We're in the attention business. Everybody's in the attention business. Whether you're selling something, a service, a good, whatever it is, uh, it's hard to get people's attention. Uh, and that is something that uh, is always a challenge and continues to be a challenge. And when I look back at you know, my life as a, as a young kid uh, versus where my daughter is now, it's no surprise she wants to update her Spotify playlist at the dinner table. Uh, she needs to multitask, right? Her time is valuable. Uh, and really what we're seeing is that video games are winning that, that battle for monopolizing people's time. Um, and if you look at um, the entire Star Wars franchise, it was sold to Disney a little while ago for about $4 billion. Um, and a year later, our friends at Activision Blizzard paid $5.4 billion, I believe it was, for Candy Crush. So entire Star Wars ecosystem, Candy Crush, right? And Candy Crush is a more valuable IP. Why? Because I talked to 22-year-olds who spend $1,000 a month playing that game, which is great for them. Um, and it, so what we're really talking about here is that, that monopolization of time. And for those of you unfamiliar with Twitch, I have a video that will probably confuse you more than help you, but we'll go down the road and try it. What is Twitch? A gaming playground? The world's biggest chat room? Awesomeness? Quirkiness? Spontaneousness? Oh my god, it's happening! You're on the right track. Yeah, boys! We are multiplayer entertainment. Created in the moment. We'll have fun! Of the moment. I'm your biggest fan. I'm my flushing. By everyone in that Push moment. Yo, we got it! Finally! From the pro streamers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brad To the up and comers. Our first subscriber! Yo, just a fridge with a subscription! Whoa! From the fans in chat. Yo, oh, do you come here often? Everybody here, yeah, you're here for to it. To the lurkers in their lurky places. <gasps> you can literally lurk in any stream. And you choose to lurk here, thank you. It's everything we're into. The games. <laughs> the throwbacks. The gaming throwbacks. The favorite episodes. In the limited editions. Mom, get the camera! Sometimes we like things for no reason. And we like it that way. You're not even looking at me! We use outside voices for inside jokes. We put skill points into sarcasm. We bless RNG on your last life, and we Bible thump when your life changes forever. I got partner, dude! No way! We got partner! <laughs> We did it! Yes! <laughs> Twitch is all of that. And all of us. Twitch, I love you! Joining forces. Forming something we don't just watch together. We make together. So my, my favorite article was the one that credited Twitch with the reintroduction of Bob Ross. Um, we did a marathon of every episode of The Joy of Painting ever. Had over 130,000 people watching concurrently, um, and it was really fun. I think, you know, the rise of gaming and pop culture is, is a big factor in this, and, and the reason why Twitch is where it is. It's cool to be a gamer. It's cool to aspire to be a professional gamer. Um, and I think that that is a really important aspect of, of kind of what the Twitch platform is and how it's growing. 
and it's accessible entertainment. The, the whole reason why Amazon paid close to a billion dollars for our platform was because we had live video chat, live video next to live chat, which if I could go back in time, that seems like a really good idea that I could have come up with a long time ago. You made a lot of money. You made a lot of money. Um, but that's really what millennials want. They expect a two-way conversation between the content that they're watching um, and the people that are, are making that content. And that's really important to understand as you know, folks looking to connect with this constituent is that the reason that esports is so widely uh, enjoyed now is mainly because of the fact that it's perfectly set up for a digital platform. Um, you're talking about people all over the world who play the exact same game with the exact same rules uh, that can watch it now live. Uh, and if you've never had the chance to watch uh, StarCraft II at 3 o'clock in the morning from a live broadcast in Korea, you really haven't lived yet. And so I highly recommend, recommend that. Um, and actually, you know, one of the really big moments that we had on Sunday was uh, the, uh, the freshman uh, congresswoman from uh, Brooklyn, New York, actually jumped on a Twitch stream and helped raise over $350,000 for charity. Uh, and she talked about, you know, her positions and opportunities uh, and Twitch is becoming a place where if you want to connect with young constituents, it's a great avenue to do that. You don't have to be great at video games. Most people who stream on Twitch aren't. Um, so it is an opportunity, I think, for a lot of folks to look at uh, as a destination platform. Um, talking about the audience really quickly to give you guys a sense of, of who gamers and, and who esports fans are, let's start with who they're not. Right? This is a stereotype that we deal with a lot, the fat recluse in their parents' basement. Um, we are successfully past that. Um, when it comes to gamers, they're physically fit. Um, sitting in a chair, playing at a high level requires just as much physical fitness as it does mental fitness. Um, they're female. We're seeing women growing at a really fast rate, uh, and there are tremendous opportunities to support women as they grow. Uh, Esports is also the most inclusive sport in the world. Um, the runner-up MVP vote-getter for the Overwatch League last year, her team went 0-32, um, but she finished second in the overall MVP voting, uh, which was amazing. And they're multicultural, uh, which I think is really important. So as you look at gaming and esports, understanding that these things are different, I think is really important um, as we go forward. Last of the audience, 80% um, of the Twitch audience is under the age of 35. Um, most of them are between 18 and 34. They're a great group of people to connect with, uh, and they, uh, they do feel a little bit disenfranchised these days. So it's a great opportunity um, to jump into that, that ecosystem. So we talk about eSports. First and foremost, don't call it eGaming. That's the first way to get called out that you don't know what you're talking about. Once we get past that, I think everyone has a different definition of what eSports is, and that's okay, because everybody, I think, in this room has probably a different definition of what sports is. Um, we have certain definitions at Twitch that we work off of, organized, competitive gaming, prize pools. Um, those things are pretty big hallmarks of what competitive esports looks like. Um, and they're broadcasted on our platform. And these people are social. These people are trendsetters. Uh, and these people are super tech savvy and actually are fairly affluent. Um, they're a great audience of people. They travel. They spend money when they travel on vacation and when they travel to events. Uh, and they're a really great audience uh, of trendsetters that you can utilize um, both from a digital perspective but also from an on-site perspective. And eSports is really in its infancy. I, I can't harp it enough. I know our first championship was back in 1972 where people played Space Wars at Stanford and the top prize was a year subscription to the Rolling Stone. Come a long way since that. Um, but understanding that esports is really just getting off the ground, it's really growing in popularity, uh, and the opportunities, the white space that's av available right now is massive. And I think for those that are looking to get into this and to reinvest and to find new opportunities, esports is a really amazing place for that to do. And if you look at the number of people who play sport and the number of people who play video games just in general, that number continues to rise. And it's a huge opportunity because we're just getting started. 90% of Overwatch League fans play the game. Less than 10% of NFL fans play the game. And so if you look at that and you take the 90% and you multiply that by 10, Brandon looks really good, uh, but also there's a gigantic audience to reach. So as we're growing this space, 
there's an opportunity to grow together. I think that's the most important thing to take away from this is that the opportunities are just getting started. If you were to look at professional football or baseball or soccer uh, and you would look 30 or 50 or 100 years ago at the opportunity, it might not look as lucrative as it does now, but I promise you it has turned into a pretty lucrative opportunity. Does that kind of make sense for everybody? Awesome. Um, so I'll stop talking now um, because mainly I let my pants do the talking, but this, this lectern is not setting me up correctly for this. Um, but Brenda, let's, let's start with you and, and Overwatch League uh, for the inexperienced. <laughs> yeah. uh, what the heck is it, and why is it dominating headlines both in the news and, and on Twitch? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned before, Activision Blizzard, some of you may remember the name Activision back when we were youth. Uh, creating very, very old games from the 70s. Um, Blizzard, and Activision has been around for a while, Blizzard has, has been around for a while too. Blizzard creates uh, wonderful titles, uh, one of which is called uh, the Over Overwatch. And Overwatch is a game, uh, it's been about for about three years, and it's played with a, for about 40 million people around the world played this game every single day. Um, and this game was custom built to be an eSport. However, a little bit uh, sort of a, of a different take on the esport world. If you take a, a quick history look at where esports has come from, and Nathan did a wonderful job of sort of laying it out, esports has traditionally been a very grassroots based initiative, right? Um, and very much a marketing expense. Companies ran esport events to drive sales of their video games, get people to get together, play these games, watch the best play, and go back and, and, and spend more in the game or buy more games. And what we did and actually the credit goes to Bobby Kotick, our CEO, was said, what, 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 sort of, what um, models work out there that can take a game and turn it into a sport? And that's clearly looking at the traditional stick and ball model, right? Whether it be ba baseball, basketball, football, soccer. Um, I come from the NBA, I was there for 11 years, I spent a little bit of time setting up the NBA 2K League. Um, and the idea was, is how do you take that model, that city-based, franchise-based model, and move it into the world of esports. And so that's exactly what we did. And, and, and Overwatch was custom built to do that. It's, it's a game that you play uh, maps. Think of it as like tennis, where you play a best of series. You are playing capture the flag. It is one team versus the other team. One team is trying to stop the other team from reaching its objective. There are 28 heroes. It's a very stylized world. It's a youth rated game. So think of it like Marvel superheroes. And each hero has a power. And just like when the Golden State Warriors play the Celtics, you have to decide, do I want to be big or small? Do I want to be fast or do I want to be my three-point shooter? Do I want to be big down low or do I want to be having uh, start five guards? It's the same concept. It's six on six making those decisions on the fly in the middle of the game. You can actually change your strategy. When one player gets, gets knocked out, you can decide to take on another hero. And these six on six, and if I had a video I'd show you, are communicating to each other with headsets. So they're with a coach in their back telling them what plays to run as you watch the map unfold and these, these teams play each other going into strategic loca locations. And we took this game and this model and said, what if we sold this as franchises? What if we went to investors and to, to traditional sports owners and we said, hey, you can own the city of Boston, you can own the city of New York, you can own the city of Shanghai and Beijing and London and Tokyo. And be, and you can, that's your slot. And so if you're Bob Kraft, who happens to own our Boston Uprising team, and you own the, the Patriots, or if you're Michael Wilpon, who owns our New York team, and you own the Mets, and this is a great example, it's a wonderful investment hedge. Because for the price you bought an Overwatch League team, you're way, way, way at the bottom level of what you did when you bought where baseball is today. And by the way, baseball's average age when viewing is like 56 years old. I think the World Series is 58. 58-year-old is the average age of watching the World Series. We are a 22-year-old age, average age sport when you watch the, uh, our, our, our games on Twitch. And we exclusively stream all of our games on their platform. So that's a general sense of sort of why the investment makes sense. And we now have this league. We now have 20 teams. We started it last year. It's about a 40-team season. It's no different than the way you think about traditional sports, home and away. Right now, all of our teams are living in Los Angeles, playing in Blizzard Arena, but in 2020, we're looking to try to get all of our teams in their local facilities, in their local markets. So now Boston will play in New York, 
no different than when the Celtics play the Knicks. They will travel to each other, they'll play each other, it's a two hour match and they'll go home. Or maybe they'll go on to the next city. And we think we'll get five to 6,000 people to come watch these home games based on the way that we're building these audiences in these markets and the viewership we currently have. Um, we had our grand finals at the Barclays Center this past year. We sold 22,000 tickets in two weeks, sold it out for two straight days. Uh, and we'll be doing that again into our second season, which starts February 14th. We now have 20 teams, and it's a global league. So we have teams in Boston, New York, and now Atlanta. We have one here in DC. Uh, we have two in Canada. We have three in Europe, four in China, and more to, more to come up to 28 slots. And that model is the model we've chosen. It's not the only model in esports. It's the model we've chosen to go down and create a professional esport league. Um, as just one of many models that are out there in the, in the world of sports. So that's sort of what Overwatch is, what Overwatch League is, and I can talk more about sort of how we think it's relevant to many of you in your cities uh, as we go. Yeah, it's really mold-breaking, I think, when we looked at this, you know, the, the philosophy, right? Like, to date, it has been, you know, teams from nondescript parts of the world coming together, playing, and they're playing in a live event. And, and you know, Jason, when it comes to NGE, like, you guys are putting on these mega events. Yeah. Um, you're bringing um, not just large scales of players, but fans to large events. Mm -hmm. Talk about a little bit what NGE is, has done to date, yeah. um, both with Twitch and, and without, yeah. um, and just talk about kind of how you guys are looking at the ecosystem when you're evaluating cities to bring these major events to. Yeah, so we, uh, NGE is not a old story uh, tale like Blizzard is. We haven't been around since the 70s. We were about a four and a half year old company at this point. But for context, to compare growth and parallel it to growth in the industry, in year one, we did about 100,000 minutes of produced live content. So things that we just saw on Twitch, 100,000 minutes. Last year, we did close to a billion minutes of live produced content. And that's year over year growth. That's not over 40 years. That's over four years, right? And so that kind of just continues to show the trajectory there. So because we partner directly with the IP holders, we don't own the IPs ourselves. So our entire goal is to amplify Blizzard's IP, Overwatch, Hearthstone, some of their other assets, as well as Twitch, we partner with them. In fact, we had a show just a few minutes ago that just wrapped um, in my studio in, in, in Los Angeles. And so by doing so, we're starting to see all these kind of shift changes, right? I mean, we saw the original kind of picture up there of the traditional gamer. Well, I can tell you for a fact, whenever we hold these events in Seattle, in London, in New York City, in Texas, and other places like that, that is no longer the case. In fact, I doubt if ever that was really the case. Um, and by doing so, what we're noticing is that this kind of groundswell of popularity that breaks through multiple different barriers of um, social, economic, uh, populist uh, issues is really kind of demographically kind of flattening out. I'll give you a really, really quick anecdote. So we ran a private event where we were actually testing, like a training facility. We tested um, very similar to probably the Cowboys. They, they practice, or right now the Patriots are practicing in a private facility. So we did the same thing for a particular publisher. Uh, we needed to go and get players, non-professionals, just off the street, just to test certain technologies. So we went and grabbed about 100 different folks. And it was a three-day event, and we allowed people to come back and line up and come in, and it was absolutely free, and we gave them free you know, gear and hats and trinkets and things like that. And every single day, there was a good percentage of those folks that would come, every, come back every single day. Uh, the last day, I was wrapping up and I was taking off, and there was a young man, he probably couldn't have been any older than 22 years old, uh, probably just out of college, um, definitely from an affluent background, was saying goodbye to his new good friend who had what I would say probably he, he's seen some stuff. He, uh, he had tattoos up and down his neck. Uh, he certainly came from a different side of the track. And they gave each other a hug and said, let's catch up soon. To see that kind of be able to break through those barriers, sure, we're, we can talk about esports. We can talk about professional gaming. We can talk about um, what that does uh, for our local communities in terms of local economic growth, and those are all true. But what gaming has done, as traditional sports has done even for me in my own life, is to be able to help me break through barriers and to connect with other people. 
And I think that's why, largely why we're here, is to continue to try to push that forward, aside from all the other ancillary growth. Yeah, and talk a little bit just about from a, a city perspective. You know, as you guys are evaluating places to bring events like Fortnite, mm -hmm. uh, Rocket League, uh, how are you guys evaluating city by city what is necessary and what is valuable um, yeah. from that live event experience? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. So you know, as Brandon mentioned, the Overwatch League is is a is a professional league, right? No different than the NBA, NFL, anything like that. Um, when I look at the world of esports, when, when we do our thesis is that esports is that and more, and I think Brandon would agree as well, um, there are many, many, many layers to it. Uh, it doesn't require professional sports. However, that's certainly the, the best way to monetize and also to really kind of uh, target. Um, when we think about cities, last year or in Boston, I had a lot of mayors come up to me and say, hey, you know, we don't have the billion dollars to set aside to build a building. And that's great, and, and that's, that's great for some cities. That makes sense for some cities. There's, there's a way for you to continue to program, but it doesn't require that. So my encouragement to you as mayors, as our um, leaders in our local communities, is to look beyond just that. Those things are good. Um, for context, my company again started four years ago, four guys in an apartment, now we have close to 120 employees. That represents 120 families that are living in Burbank, California. That also represents a large and growing ecosystem of vendors that we utilize to help put on our productions, from carpenters all the way down to production gear equipment folks, to the local restaurants that benefit from those things, right? So there, there are ways that, that, that'll help. In terms of the live events, when we look at live event cities, really what we're looking for is the local cities to help partner with us, to help us understand uh, capacity issues for your venues. Uh, for me, power and internet are the most important. This is a digital prod, um, you know, product. If we don't have any internet, it's gonna be pretty hard to do what we do. We can probably figure a way to do that. Um, to have a strong infrastructure. And I think the other part of it too is unfortunately, unfortunately at the same time, is that there's been a spotlight that has uh, been shown on esports and the growing need for community involvement with uh, security and safety measures. Um, being able to partner directly with the cities and to say, hey, this is a thing that we're thinking about doing. We're forecasting close to 12,000 people on any given day and we would like local support. Or at least point us in the direction of who we can talk to to make sure that everybody has a great safe time and that continues to want to come back, right? Because our goal here is to continue to grow it, and we certainly don't want anything to tarnish that or anything catastrophic to happen. Um, I think the other things, too, is to help us understand how we can be involved in an ongoing effort as opposed to the drop-in single event, right? Brandon and, and Activision Blizzard's model of putting the teams within their local geographies is incredible, and from that will be born other programs from high school to collegiate to amateur which will basically fill out the backbone of your city i guarantee you right now there are citizens and folks in your local community that are meeting unofficially and they are playing their own tournaments unofficially they are in hotel <laughs> conference rooms similar to this and they're just playing for fun so figuring out ways to actually get behind that, I think that will actually continue yeah, to drive if that. Yeah, I could add one thing to that. You know, we, we don't even have our teams yet living and playing in their local market, but we have, we have fan groups that have already started in every one of these cities. If you talk to our Dallas team or our Houston team, our New York team, very, very active fan groups just getting together because the internet brought them together and finding places to meet to watch these matches that are happening in Los Angeles and then supporting their team who's not even yet living in their city. And, and I think we're gonna see much more of that as we begin to put our games at least in, these local, in our local communities and then as we expand into more and more cities, um, that this will be no different than the way your local communities support your local AA, AAA baseball team, your MLS team, your, ba your, baseball, your basketball team, your football team, and the ecosystem that builds around it will exist, whether it be done through the way we're structuring it or through the way it might be through an event-based structure or having one of these esports teams based in your backyard. So I did promise interactivity and Tom I was holding me to that. So uh, we're gonna take a brief intermission from the panelists and we're gonna go actually onto Twitch and actually talk with one of our broadcasters live. Um, 
Is there anyone that would like to ask a question of our broadcaster? Yes? Okay. You get to ask that question. What would you like to ask? How much money is Oh. That's a great question. Uh, so this is our friend Swifter. Um, Racism is not tolerated here or anywhere on Twitch. There you go. He couldn't have been more tolerant. Well, um, so Swifter is a streamer. He streams about uh, 60 hours a week. Uh, usually streams 8 to, 10, 8 to 12 hours a day, 5 to 6 days a week. Uh, right now he's playing a game called Treasure Hunter Simulator, uh, which I believe is just you digging up treasure around a game. So you'll see people talking in chat. Um, and really when it comes to the revenue side, I'm going to actually financially support him right now. So we have a a thing called bits, and bits are a digital good, not a currency. Um, $18. But I can. Someone else just gave him $18. There we go. Finally. So I'm going to give Swifter some some digital goods called Look bits, boys. and he's going to be good. able to then get a paycheck from the, those bit uh, those bits. There's a lot more to the monetization of Twitch, but I'll have him talk to us a little bit because when you cheer bits to broadcasters, they actually respond to you, uh, and I'll show you that right now as we kind of share with him some bits. All right, so as you're watching, I just sent some bits. So you'll notice on his stream, he'll actually get the alert that I gave him some digital goods, and he'll actually respond. It takes a second or two usually to, to go through. Um, oh, there we go. Yes. yes. Translates to a payout to him. You can't take the Twitch bits off the platform, but when you cheer them to a broadcaster, it, they get a revenue share of that bits that was cheered to them. Uh -huh. from, from Twitch. So you buy the bits from Twitch and you give them to the broadcasters That's and then the Twitch hook. gives them the content there. Looks kind of nice. A medium-sized metal hook of some sort. So all of your kids have credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make sure you review That is their, being uh, charged monthly. as this happens. All right. Let's go back to the office and get a new quest. Uh, 13 is the minimum age, um, but you have to have a valid credit card, which means your parents have to approve it in some way, shape, or form. It uses the Amazon wallet. Uh, let's see here. Find the pickle hob. Gettysburg is a little expensive to get to. I mean, the best way to think about it while Nathan is, is pulling it up is imagine LeBron James is about to shoot a 40-footer, and he hits the 40-footer in the middle of the playoffs. And then those of us who are watching the game decide, that was a great shot. So I'm going to press a button to say, great shot. That's essentially what this is. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. You're also showing... Think, think of it also socially. You're also showing the other people who are watching him that you are cheering him on. So as you send a bit, the other, say, 100,000 people who are watching also see that you sent that bit. And so there's a bit of an ego play to it, right? Like you're, you're cheering him on and the other people are watching you cheering him on. And so people sort of want to cheer on their favorite streamers and cheer on as they watch them do things that they can't do themselves. So there's a community aspect to it. <laughs> Credit cards can be genuine. Yeah. yeah. But but I but I think to that point, right? So that to that point it is a different way of connectivity. The 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 general thought process or stereotype is that gamers sit in their basement in the dark playing by themselves. And just by base watching this for a few minutes, the right panel, the comment section are people all over the world engaging with each other, engaging with the streamer. So it really is not an isolated activity. In fact, it's, it's, it's actually quite active. <laughs> no. So as you can hear, he's actually talking back. We are showing them your stream. 
they're very excited exactly. about Twitch. Well, hello, everybody, all the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, <laughs> Monty Badger, do you need some help? Should I uh, explain Twitch, or do you have it on your end? Money so, Badger stole your wrench. Yes, Rockets, you lost your wrench. So you can see the chats happening and the engagements happening, right, all in real time. And so I'm going to let him explain Twitch. Okay, sure. Uh, so Twitch is a live streaming platform that uh, content creators, um, people that might be pros at a video game or maybe just somebody who's passionate about a video game. Honestly, you don't even have to just play video games on this platform. People, um, uh, people on this platform are able to stream. You know, people do in real life streams, also known as IRL streams, where they stream their day-to-day -day life. I've seen people who are bounty hunters like live stream their um, their job. You know, their daily job. I've seen people do cooking streams. Um, basically, it's just a place where you can help build a community of like-minded individuals that enjoy a hobby. Uh, Does anyone want to ask him a question? Um, that you might do so for instance my favorite football I team a, i guess i call you myself a professional players. madden player um more so into the teaching realm now so i use my stream as a platform to help people get better at the game um people come into the chat they ask questions i give them time and or give them answers in real time um ask him what the biggest challenge is with the work doing, greatest challenge for what for doing this type of work yep Finding time to sleep, I'm sure, is his answer. Support streamers, um, where the streamers can earn a little bit of revenue to, um, my, I think my game is frozen here, uh, but streamers can earn a little bit of revenue to, uh, you know, supplement their income. Um, there's two different levels of, uh, I guess, earning revenue. One is called um, partnership, which is the full... Boy, he's really got this whole thing down. I, this is, I, he didn't even know I was going to do this today. So. Number of viewers consistently over a period of time, and then you're in partnership. And then there's the affiliate program where it's kind of like a startup. He's got the whole thing down. I want to get into streaming full time. Um, myself, I don't personally stream full time. Correct. You can set up a voice chat room if you want to, but that's not something that's required. It's just the, the conversation happens two way. And also, you'll see people in chat are responding to me as well. So you can have a conversation with people in chat while the broadcaster is broadcasting as well. That is his own house, he, which he pays for with his money he makes from Twitch. Um, I would say that the top esports athletes, you know, are making six figures pretty comfortably. Some of the top Twitch streamers are making anywhere from four to eight million dollars a year. Um, so it, it's a lucrative. It's starting to be a lucrative profession. So when your kid says, "I want to be," you know, "I want to be a, a Twitch streamer." Maybe, maybe, but remember, if they say they want to be an actor, right, there's a, there's a tier between working in a coffee shop and being Will Smith, right? So it's the same thing with our platform. Appreciate that, Matt and Euro. Thank you, man. Fireflame song request? Yeah, so my subs, you know, my subs basically... <laughs> They pay five dollars a month to be subbed to my cool. channel. Cool. Anyway, that is the experience. I encourage you all just twitch.tv um, and check it out. I think it's a really fun place to go and kind of interact with brands um, and with broadcasters. Put my sales hat on there for a second. Um, so, in terms of kind of getting back to some of the conversations that we were talking about earlier, um, you know, I think one of the things both Jason and Brandon we see in traditional sports are the first pitch. Right, the coin toss. There are all these easy ways to include local municipalities and local political figures in connecting with, the, with traditional sports. For Overwatch League, for what you guys do at NGE, like, how can mayors get more involved? How can they be more visually um, present when it comes to these opportunities? You, oh, Jason. Yeah, you can take this if you want. I, <laughs> so May, Mayor Garcetti, uh, I've, I've been talking to his staff for a while about having him come out. Uh, being in Los Angeles and, and having the luxury of having a lot of the teams local for Overwatch League and other things like that, we've been talking about getting him out there. I, th I think the key, though, um, and the one thing that I, I warned his staff about was to ensure that uh, he was doing it in a way that was not, um, would not be seen by the community as a way to pander. And I, I think this community in particular is very, very sensitive to that. You don't have to love games. You just 
be your genuine self. So we've been we've been talking to Mayor Garcetti's staff about bringing him onto one of these streams. Yeah, I, what I would say is um, what I've what I've learned in my in my one year now, a little bit over a year uh, in in sort of hardcore in esports is is that this is a group of people that want to see their sports succeed and they really really engage right so when i when i started here i was always told oh if you're not if you're not authentic if you can't figure out how to be authentic <laughs> they're going to turn you off and we we laugh about this all the time because authentic is a bunch of crap it's they they want to see they want to see this sport succeed because for them they don't watch stick and ball like my son who's 10 doesn't even want to sit down and watch a football game with me or a basketball game. He is on Twitch, he's playing video games, he's talking to his friends. That's where this whole thing is going. And so what I would say is that this ecosystem is going to continue to grow in every one of your cities, whether it be a professional team on our end, whether it be a university team, which is definitely happening. There are, we're already working with 2,000 universities around the country uh, who are having eSport clubs. 50 universities, Division One, are now offering um, scholarship programs for for people to come to the university and play Ohio State is leading the way in that area so th these are things that are going to happen for kids to come together and do what they like to do and be with the type of people they want to be with you're going to see this stuff break out in your communities and I would just say engage with it and embrace it because it is what's going to be happening in the future uh, and you will work with them no different than the way that you work with other fans of other professional sports or other universities in your in your market yeah, I'll end with an anecdote in that our, our, my friends at uh, Events DC did a really nice broadcast uh, last year where they actually connected with the Boys and Girls Club and actually live streamed an event with an esports team in the local Boys and Girls Club as a great way to kind of bring people together. Um, and it did really well on the platform. People on the platform really got excited about it. Um, and just in general with the engagement, I mean, the Twitch platform, people have raised over $75 million for charity on the Twitch platform. So it is a really great place for engagement, whether that's esports, whether that's gaming, whether that's charity. Um, there's just a lot of those opportunities out there. We have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to yeah. throw it back in case there are questions. Yeah, I'm going to, because um, i got to make sure i got to get them to their reception. Um, yes, don't get away any, into the any drinks. Do have any questions? Bullying. Bullying? Is there bullying One thing I was impressed, I, I, we had a conversation about this, and I was really impressed with the Twitch platform and sort of the respect um, that they all have for one another. It was really um, interesting. And they, you guys do a great job of saying, you know, we don't tolerate this, and you sort of have this culture, I think. Talk yeah, a little bit about that. First and foremost, we're, we're not a free, a free speech platform. We're a community. So um, if you want to be in our club, you need to play by the rules. And we've worked really tirelessly on protecting our broadcasters because going live on the internet is a very scary thing. Uh, and so we have human moderation. We have um, automatic moderation. We have AI moderation. We've worked with Activision Blizzard on um, to make going live on the internet a safe space. Um, no one should feel bullied. No one should feel um, you know, mistreated by going live on the internet. That's just not acceptable. So we take that stance very seriously. Um, and we're really lucky in the fact that I think everyone in the gaming space feels very strongly about breaking down those stereotypes and weeding out those characters in the space because uh, at the end of the day, most of the people that work in gaming are gamers in some way, shape, or form, and we don't want to play with those people. So we've found it, at least on the Twitch platform, we've taken a really zero tolerance policy on that um, to the extent now where we'll follow people outside of their Twitch channel, and if they do things outside of their Twitch channel that we don't like, we send them packing. Um, it's just it's it's a right and a privilege to be on our platform, and uh, and it's a right and a privilege to be in you know the Overwatch League. It's a right and a privilege to be at live events. Um, none of this stuff is is guaranteed, so we take that stuff pretty seriously. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to ask you to go ahead. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Are you aware of any uh, cities that have parks and recreation programs like we offer? You know, baseball and basketball and soccer and things like that. Are you aware of any cities that have parks and rec programs that offer esports? Is you know you talk about it being like a professional league where there's, you know, there's cities that have it. Well, in basketball, there's cities that have professional teams, colleges, universities, but yeah. there's also parks and rec, local teams. And so, um, are you aware of any? And if not, uh, or if there are, do you know what the uh, infrastructure costs, or what would a city need in order to offer something like that through its parks and yeah, rec program? Yeah, it's a great question, Jason. You may may have in, uh, insight into it too. <clears throat> I would say that. You know, we try to support the ecosystem. So just like we have a professional league, we need to find players 
uh, and players are happening all over the place. And so um, there are grassroots things happening all over the place that we monitor because anytime in our world, anytime you want to play our game, you have to go onto our server. So we know where these 40 million people are at any given time playing our game. Um, and this is happening at a local level in many cases, very much grassroots and sort of put together. Um, what we have developed, though, is, a, is a, a program to help those communities. And so we, we have a minor league system called Contenders. We have the next step down, which is TESPA, which helps our universities and high school level folks. And so I don't, I'm not aware of any sort of professional organization on our end or in, in the world that's sort of dealing with Parks and Rec. But it's a natural space to go to because you don't need a lot of infrastructure to put on more grassroots-based programs, particularly for us if it's, if it's younger youth, let's say in the, in the 13 to 16 range who are just learning the game and learning how to play, because that just we want more and more people to play the game because it's just like the game of basketball. If you bounce a basketball, you, you end up liking the game of basketball. It's no different with our game. If you play our game, you end up liking the sport. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying I can't directly answer your question other than say I love the idea and I love to dig into it more. Yeah, I, I will Mayor. shout out a, a friend of mine, Josh Hafkin, has a, a, a company called Game Gym, and it's actually here in, in Bethesda. Uh, and he has a, you know, it, it's a building space that he has dedicated to a place where kids can come and, and train, and there are coaches who are approved. Um, and it's nothing fancy, it's nothing over the top, but uh, it's a place where parents can send their kids to learn and play and compete and kind of you know, grow in those spaces. Um, and I think that that is a good start, um, but a Parks and Recs program could very easily set up a similar looking style at a very inefficient cost. Mayor, I could add to that. Mayor Sheevy? Yeah. Go right ahead. Jeff Williams, Mayor of Arlington, Texas. Mayor, I think you're very perceptive. Uh, there is a tremendous demand that's out there. It's, it's pretty phenomenal, and I'll give you an example. Of course, Nate mentioned the youth. Uh, the, I was at the opening of uh, one of our businesses that was expanding. It's L3. They're a defense contractor. They have 500 software engineers. After we got through with the dedication of the building, all they wanted to talk about was eSports. We have built an eSports stadium in our community. Well, these guys wanted to have, they said, how far along are you in the Parks and Rec deal? Because we want to play Lockheed Martin. We want to play their engineers. <laughs> we think it, it's, you know, it's a tremendous market there besides the youth market. And so our Parks and Recreation Department, which, by the way, won the gold medal championship, now this is their next step, is to move into this area because the infrastructure you need for it is not much at all, but think about uh, perhaps even some of your uh, your biggest places playing your championships there. Uh, you know, of course, in our city, they're all dying to play a you know intramural championship game in our esports stadium. But then there's something else about going into AT and T Stadium where the Cowboys play, and to see Overwatch on that screen that's 60 yards long and 70 feet tall gets pretty exciting. Even the Jonas Brothers were in there playing that. You know, it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. But when you talk about the opportunity here for money, there you go. You know the amount of uh, revenue that you generate from your intramural or for your sports leagues there. But the, the real truth of the matter, the opportunity here with uh, being able to market to millennials and beyond from companies sponsoring these, and, of course, they could do the same thing, Think about the, uh, your Little League Baseball and the name of companies on the back of that. Well, just an emblem on the front might generate $100,000 or more on the right player. And then, but uh, really, the company spending money to sponsor these is very real money, and it's growing. And then when you think about the quality of Brandon Snow crossing over, here from the NBA, you see that, and then look at the owners of these teams now, and that's what got our attention. Right now, you're seeing owner of the Boston Celtics on them, the Patriots. Jerry Jones in our community, the Cowboys bought one. Our Texas Rangers bought owners bought two, and Mark Cuban of the Dallas Mavericks bought one. But then, conversely, uh, when, when they start buying into it, you know there's a lot of money and, uh, that is involved but also think about the opportunity to attract young talent and keep young talent in your community because this is such an, an important thing. So it just goes on and on, and we need to stop, don't we, Mayor? But anyway. Uh. 
a lot of advantages, anyway. and we are at yeah. the beginning. But I thought it was fascinating what you've done and um, really seeing the vision for this. And, you know, Jason talked about 12,000 people coming to your city. We're talking about that today. What about in four years? It could be, you know, 50,000. So everyone needs to kind of realize this is a game changer in the space. I'm going to wrap it up because I know you guys are probably hungry, want to go to the reception. Are you guys going to be sticking around? Because I'd love for yes. mayors to be able to ask you some questions. Yep. And then also Tom McClyman was nice enough um, to get everyone some uh, free swag and goodies from the different teams. So I want you guys to be able to pick those up on your way out. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. And have a great conference, everyone. Thank you.